Good morrow, friends. I'm Jordan, and this is Not Strictly History. Aloha and hello to all of my friends. It is fantastic to be here with you today. I hope you're having a fantastic Wednesday. Today is an exciting day, and in my notes I wrote, it's exciting because it's a day of firsts, and then I realized something incredibly silly. Last week was also a a week of firsts. (laughs) Last week was our first movie episode, which was fabulous. I hope you all enjoyed Pretty in Pink. Thank you for being there with me through that. This week, we have another first. This week, my friends, we're going to be talking about a book. Woohoo! Okay, I'm actually really, really excited. Um, I always say that, but it's, it's generally true. Um, <laughs> I'm excited because I love literature. Obviously, I mean, fun fact, guys, I'm actually a published author. Anyway, but I've always loved stories. I've always loved to read. And I've actually just been so freaking excited to do episodes about some of my favorite books. But it's actually similar to the whole, so the whole movie thing. Like, it's really hard to decide which ones to pick. And you wouldn't think that at first because you're just like, oh, there's a million movies. There's a million books. Do them all. Not everything is easy to explain, you know, not everything is digestible in one episode or, you know, we will be doing some two-part episodes, just so you know, that is coming in the future. But anyway, there's just a lot to choose from. And um, I mean, even it's also a lot because even once you do land on a topic, you know, once you do pick a movie, once you do pick a book, you, you know, you want to be able to do it justice. You know, whatever topic you choose, You want to be able to do it justice. So, you know, that's just really important, no matter what we're talking about. So anyway, after a lot of agonizing and some research, here we are, our very first episode about a book. Today, my friends, we are talking about a book called The Good Earth. Now, if you have not heard of this book, you are in for a treat, just absolutely a treat. If you have heard of this book, you're still in for a treat because now we can all discuss it together and have a great time. But just to make sure that we're all clear, we will be talking about the book from beginning to end, just like we did in our movie episode. So you will be getting spoilers, but trust me, there is still so much to keep looking looking into after the end of this. Like, don't panic, okay? That's that. Just don't panic. So the Good Earth, just very quickly. The Good Earth was written by author Pearl S. Buck, and it was released on March 2nd, 1931. It was the best-selling book in the United States in 1931 and in 1932, and it won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 1932. It also definitely influenced Pearl S. Buck, winning the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1938, and Fun fact, my friends, she was the first American woman to win this award. Thank you for cheering. I can hear you. So The Good Earth was included in Life Magazine's list of 100 outstanding books of 1924 through 1944. It sprang back up on the bestseller list in 2004 when Oprah added it to her book club. There was also a Broadway adaptation of the book in 1932. It didn't do super great. It only had 56 performances. However, there was a film made of it in 1937, and this was a lot more successful. So those are just a few of the the bare minimum facts about this book, and I'm really excited to talk with you more about it. So you're probably thinking, okay, thank you for telling me all of these things about this book, Um, but what is this book? What is it even about? Why are we actually here? These are fantastic questions, and I will now give you the answers to them. But before I do so, I have to tell you about my personal experience with this book, because that's actually why we're here, is because I had an experience with this book and needed to share it. So this book, The Good Earth by Pearl S. Buck, is actually a book that I had to read for an English class in high school. Now, the teacher did not like me, she was actually pretty rude to me most of the time, um, but she loved this book, just gushed and gushed about this book and made us read it. So naturally, I thought it would be terrible. Plus, I mean, let's be honest, who actually likes a book that they had to read for school? Like, 
Even if you read a fantastic book in school, you hate it because you had to read it for school. That's just like universal knowledge, I feel. But anyway, nevertheless, I read this book for class and it was it's just, it's fantastic. I absolutely devoured this book. It's so different from any kind of book that I've ever read, both in story and in style. And I just remember feeling like I was being pulled through the pages. Now, here's the other thing. I've only read this book one time back in high school. And, but it's still sticks with me. It's still a book that I think about all the time. I still remember so many things about this book. And if that doesn't tell you, I mean, what an impact it has, like, I don't know how to explain it. You know, like I read it one time a long time ago and I'm still thinking about it today. You know, I'm in my late twenties now and I'm still thinking about this book that I read in high school. It's, it's absolutely incredible. So my dudes, you're asking, okay, Jordan, that's great. What is The Good Earth? I will now tell you. The Good Earth is a historical novel that is set in timeless China, meaning that there's never any explicit dates given in order for you to know like when it took place or there's no specific year that's ever given. There are, however, some vague references to things throughout the book. So, you know, events and things that can kind of give you a general sense of when it might be set. But again, it never explicitly states when it is. Um, for example, trains are mentioned at one point, and it's clear that they're still new in China. So this would place the timeline in the early 1900s. So, okay, to put it very, very simply, this novel is a dramatization of family life in a Chinese village. That's the simplest thing you can say. But guys, real talk. This book is about so, so many things. It tells the story of one man and his family, but it also is about faith and tradition. It's about love and trust and honor. I mean, uh, okay, it's incredible. It's, it's incredible. And a running theme... Um, in this book is that is the theme of the land. So the main character starts out as a poor farmer. And even though his fortunes change and eventually he becomes quite wealthy, his love for the land and his attachment to it are always incredibly strong. Hence the title, The Good Earth. So I actually super related to this and, and always have because I grew up on a farm and um, it's just always resonated with me. My family and I growing up on a farm and farming and everything, it's just kind of always been a part of us, this love for the land. So that was something that I understood. Um, but a love for the land and the land is what is what really matters. You know, the land is kind of this um, sacred thing, kind of almost, almost like an entity in a way, which I mean, maybe that sounds silly, but... It, <sighs> The land is, as long as you have land, you'll be okay, essentially. that I mean, it's this loving, beautiful force that, that cradles you and protects you. And this is the theme that runs throughout the book and that is really important. So like I said, but we've got, we've got a bunch of other themes running through the book as well. So we're going to move on and um, we're going to talk about, we're going we're gonna to move on to the most important part. We're going to um, do a summary. I'll tell you the story. Let's do that. Let me tell you the story of the good earth. So the main character in our story is a man by the name of Wang Lung. Our story begins on his wedding day. Now his marriage has been arranged and he will be marrying the slave of a nearby wealthy family. Now this family is incredibly well-to-do. They are, again, very, very wealthy. And um, to put it simply, they're a really big deal. Okay. They live in a nearby town. Um, they are known as the house of Wang. And um, one of their slaves by the name of Olan has been chosen to marry Wang Lung. Now, Olan is described as being very plain, but she's also described as really hardworking and very pure. After she and Wang Lung are married, they both work very hard on their small farm and they begin to slowly save up enough money to buy one plot of land at a time from the house of Huang. Now, let's talk about this. 
Why, you may be asking, is this incredibly powerful and wealthy family selling plots of their land to these peasants, essentially? Well, I will tell you. The truth of the matter is that the House of Wang is slowly declining. The family is rife with opium use, massive spending, uncontrolled borrowing, and general laziness, really. So even though they're still on top and their decline is slow, Wang Lung has the ability to take advantage of their slow fall and kind of make it the catalyst for his rise, which is pretty impressive, to be honest. So Olan and Wang Lung have six children together, three boys and three girls. We'll talk a little bit more about their sons later, but um, right now I want to talk to you about their daughters. So when their oldest daughter is very little, maybe about a year old, a devastating drought and famine hits the region. There is no work and there's no food. Everybody is absolutely destitute and starving. There's rumors of cannibalism going around. Um, It's just, it's, it's really, really serious. It's a very dire situation. So this, this daughter, um, Wang Lung starts calling her the poor fool because she has, I mean, she's very small and is suffering and somehow she still stays alive. And there's this moment when he's looking at her and he can't believe that she's still alive. And she's, I mean, she's wasting away and he's, and it kind of, there's this moment where he looks at her and thinks this fact that she's clinging to life and she's still surviving through all of this, it kind of puts this affection for her in his heart where he knows that if times had been normal, he wouldn't have really cared about her because she was a girl, but because they're suffering together and he's seeing her persevere somehow. He has this love for her, even though he calls her the poor fool. Um, So because she lives through this drought and through severe starvation, um, this malnutrition and everything, it leaves her permanently damaged. So she has some some kind of handicap and um, but she always has a special place in her father's heart mostly because he pities her, to be honest, but he always takes care of her and he treats her really well. He always makes sure that she's safe and has what she needs. Their second daughter, very unfortunately, is born at the same time that the drought hits. So this part of the book is actually just devastating in many, many ways. But this particular part, when their second daughter is born... It's something that I find myself thinking about a lot. I have thought about this part a lot of times over the years and wondered about it. And um, so it's kind of, I fun isn't the right word, but I think it's good that we're talking about it. So Olan gives birth by herself. She This is what she does every single time she goes into labor. Every time she goes into labor, she walks into the house and gives birth to the baby, and she often will come back outside after giving birth and help Wang Lung in the fields. And, um, like, that's what she does. The You know, she has their first two children are boys, and that's what she does both times that she gives birth to the boys. And because of the way that, you know, literally everything is, Wang Lung sees this as reasonable, Um, you know, that's something that she should do. Go give birth to the baby. Okay. Then come back outside and help work. So they're in the drought and, um, all of them are starving. They're just laying around starving and Wang Lung, um, decides, Hey, you know, maybe we could go South. There's a city in the South that they could go to, to maybe try and find work and food. And he, he goes to Alan and tells her about this and she says, okay, you know, this is a good idea. At least we, you know, if we die, we could die on our way there. You know, we could die walking and that would be better. But then she says, can we please wait until tomorrow? Um, because I'm going to go into like, I'm going to give birth. And so I'll be done giving birth by tomorrow. And he was like, he says, okay, we can wait till tomorrow. So uh, it's just, uh, I'm, I'm pausing cause it's, I'm just, I'll just read it. Okay. I'll read through my notes. We can do this together. So she goes into their bedroom and gives birth to this baby. Wang Lung, he waits outside kind of in the common room and um, his other kids are with their grandfather in his bedroom. Now, Wang Lung, his father does live with them and he's a he's a fairly big part of the book, but I won't be talking about him much because you can kind of talk about it without him. However, just kind of keep in mind that he is here. 
Um, again, when Olan is giving birth in their bedroom, he's kind of waiting in the common area and the kids and the grandfather are in another bedroom. So he waits outside and eventually he hears the, the, he hears the baby cry. And after he hears this first cry that he's very familiar with, um, he, they just hear silence. And eventually Wang Lung goes and knocks on the door and says, you know, hey, like what's going on? And he sees that the baby is dead. Um, Olan had smothered the baby right after it was born. Wang Lung understands immediately that she has done this because the baby would only suffer incredibly and probably die anyway. It's, I mean, it's actually a miracle that she carried the baby full term anyway. And um, it's also mentioned that, of course, I mean, not having the baby to worry about makes it easier for all of them to survive. But it's this part of the book is just intense is definitely a word, but it's just, it's beyond devastating. So this happens and Wang Lung takes the baby outside and, you know, does his best to bury it, but he's so weak that he can't really, he wraps it in something and leaves it by a grave. And then, you know, the next day they, they leave to go south. But this, this one moment in the book, I mean, every moment in this book, good grief, but this particular moment is just packed with emotion. It's packed with so many things. You know, emotion is only, only it's, it's just, there's so much going on. And I actually, I found, I would like to read a little bit of it. Um, the book is in public domain, so I'm pretty sure I'm allowed to do this. And I'm just going to read it for you because I want to, first of all, I want you to hear the story, the the style that the story is written in, and um, then you'll be able to kind of get more of an idea of what this moment is like for all of them. So let's begin. That night he stayed in the middle room. The two boys were in the old man's room, and in the third room, Olan gave birth alone. He sat there as he had sat during the birth of his firstborn son and listened. She would not even yet have him near her at her hour. She would give birth alone, squatting over the old tub she kept for the purpose, creeping about the room afterwards to remove the traces of what had been, hiding as an animal does the birth stains of its young. He listened intently for the small, sharp cry he knew so well, and he listened with despair. Male or female, it mattered nothing to him now. There was only another mouth coming which must be fed. It would be merciful if there were no breath, he muttered. And then he heard the feeble cry, how feeble a cry, hang for an instant upon the stillness. But there is no mercy of any kind in these days, he finished bitterly, and he sat listening. There was no second cry, and over the house the stillness became impenetrable. But for many days there had been stillness everywhere, the stillness of inactivity and of people each in his own house waiting to die. This house was filled with such stillness. Suddenly Wang Lung could not bear it. He was afraid. He rose and went to the door of the room where Olan was, and he called into the crack, and the sound of his own voice heartened him a little. You are safe, he called to the woman. He listened. Suppose she had died as he sat there, but he could hear a slight rustling. She was moving about, and at last she answered her voice a sigh. Come. He went in then, and she lay there upon the bed, her body scarcely right raising the cover. She lay alone. Where is the child, he asked. She made a slight movement of her hand upon the bed, and he saw upon the floor the child's body. Dead, he exclaimed. Dead, she whispered. He stooped and examined the handful of its body, a wisp of bone and skin, a girl. He was about to say, but I heard its crying, alive. And then he looked at the woman's face. Her eyes were closed, and the color of her flesh was the color of ashes, and her bones stuck up under the skin, a poor silent face that lay there, having endured to the utmost, and there was nothing he could say. After all, during these months, he had had only his own body to drag about. What agony of starvation this woman had endured with the starved creature gnawing at her from within, desperate for its own life. He said nothing, but he took the dead child into the other room and he laid it upon the earthen floor and searched about until he found a broken mat and this he wrapped about it. So that's all I'll read of that part, but that will give you, that gives you a sense of how the story is written and 
this incredibly heavy moment that they experienced together. Okay, so remember, we're talking about their daughters right now. Let's talk about their third daughter. She is born much later, um, and she comes in a pair of twins. And she comes at a time when the family has become really prosperous and wealthy. And because of this, Wang Lung insists on having her feet bound. Um, If you don't know about feet binding, I will add a link. It was a Chinese practice to bind the feet of wealthier little girls. Um, It was seen as more delicate and beautiful. Again, I'll add some links if you want to look more into that. Um, Anyway, so he insists on having her feet bound and having her make an advantageous match because they're moving up in the world. So she is betrothed to a wealthy boy in town at the age of nine, and then she goes to live with her new family around the age of 13. And again, that's their third daughter. So now that we've established their daughters, let's back up a bit and let's go back to the famine. When this horrible famine hits... Wang Lung and Olan have three kids, as you all know. They have two sons and their little daughter. So the famine is absolutely horrible, and they're so destitute that they, again, they decide to leave south to go to the city. And and they do this the day after Olan gives birth to their baby who dies. And listen, I'm very well aware that I'm brushing over this incident. And I'm doing that because I would rather not get into a discussion about it at this time. Because we can get into the discussion about it. That's fine. I encourage us all to discuss things and talk about all of this. But this moment, and this is another reason why I read the excerpt, is so that you can understand how Olan is at this moment after she's given birth to her baby and then smothered it. And um, there's a lot here that we don't understand. And I understand this is a fictionalized account, but if this would, I just, there's a lot going on here. And I, I, the only thing that I'm going to say is that there's a lot we don't understand. If we would, I, again, I encourage discussion. We can talk about it in comments. You can DM me. That's great. But I'm not going to talk about the death of their little girl anymore because it's incredibly devastating and it was devastating for them as well. And I think that that's all that needs to be said. So the next day they decide to leave their farm and go south. So around this time, Wang Lung's uncle had actually approached him and offered to buy all of their land and their house and all of their things, but for way less money than it was worth. So Wang Lung is absolutely not going to sell his land, obviously. So he decides that they'll sell everything to the uncle except for their house and their land. And they, and with this money, they're able to head south. So this, this is where we get our first reference to about what time we might be in. So Wang Lung is worried about the trip south because everybody is so weak. I mean, Olan just gave birth, but everybody is, has been starving for months. He's so worried that walking south is something that they won't survive. But then he finds out that they can ride the, quote, fire wagon south for a fee. Now, this is obviously the train, and it is what it was called in the early days of trains in China. So he uses the little bit of money they have to buy all of them passage on the train to get them south to the city. Now, once they're in this southern city, which again is never named, Olan and the children begin to beg every day so does Wang Lung's father. Um, the old man isn't good at begging, essentially. Nothing. He just ends up sitting there and looking out at life. And basically, that's what he does. So, um, and Wang Lung starts to earn money pulling a rickshaw, which is one of those like buggy type things. And that's not a professional way to explain it at all. It's one of those things that you sit in and the person pulls you around you know what I'm talking about. Thank you. So even though they're all now safe-ish and they have some kind of hope to survive, they're still fairly starving and poor and, um, you know, living on the street. And they feel incredibly misplaced as any of us would. But I mean, they're in this metropolitan city there. I mean, they're, yes, they're with fellow Chinese people, but they feel like aliens among them. And 
it's, I can't imagine how any of that would feel, but there are actually a lot of refugees in the city that all came to try and find work and food. So, um, the city starts giving out charitable meals to all the refugees every single day for one cent. So they are getting these meals and are no longer starving, but they're still completely poor and living on the street. And during all this time, Wang Lung is just constantly, constantly longing to return to his land. And it's, again, it's this running theme. He just wants to go home to his land where they'll be safe and happy. And this is when a revolution begins. And again, this kind of puts us in the early 1900s. And at this point, men all over the city are being drafted into the army. Now, listen to me. Wang Lung isn't necessarily against fighting or anything like that, but he knows that if he gets conscripted into the army, that his family will die and they will lose their farm. So he gets a different job, unloading supplies in the middle of the night, so that he can avoid the authorities and stay hidden during the day. And he does this for quite a while. Eventually, a food riot erupts in the city. Wang Lung and Olan are swept into the rioting crowd and they find themselves in the house of a wealthy man. And um, the crowd, this this whole crowd of people rioting, they're just looting this man's house. And Wang Lung ends up cornering this man and basically threatening his life, and the man gives Wang Lung all of his money in order to save himself. At this very same time, Olan is somewhere else in the house, and she discovers a cache of jewels hidden away, and she keep and she takes them and keeps them secret for a while. So Wang Lung now has a bunch of money given to him from the guy, so they use this money to leave the city and go home, which is a very joyful experience for all of them to be able to go home. Once they're there, Wang Lung buys a new ox and farm tools, and he also hires servants to work the land for him. This is when their twins are born, daughter number three and son number three. And you might be saying to me, Jordan, why aren't you saying their names? The way that this book is written, you rarely hear anybody's name, to be honest. And it's actually not awkward like you'd think it would be. Again, I encourage you to read the book. So the twins are born. At this time, Olan finally shows Wang Lung the jewels that she found, and she asks if she can keep two pearls for herself, which he is fine with. So he gives her the two pearls, and then he uses the rest of the jewels to purchase all of the remaining land from the house of Wang. So at this point, they're pretty prosperous. They've got money. They've got resources. It's a complete 180 from starving on the streets of the city. Like, Life is very different for them now than it has been in a long time. And at this point, Wang Lung decides to send his two older sons to school. He apprentices the second son to a merchant and he keeps his third son home to learn about and to learn about the farm and to learn how to work the farm. And this is kind of when we get to the point in the book where we're learning more about his sons and about their different personalities. His oldest son as his heir is he's he's kind of arrogant to be honest um he's a little bit of a i don't want to call him spoiled but he's just he's a rich kid i think i think that he he really grows into them having money and being prosperous their second son again he was apprenticed to a merchant so he is very very smart he's very good at math he's good with numbers he's very shrewd their youngest son who again he keeps with him on the farm to learn about agriculture and farming his son son number 3 is very very passionate and he has a lot of ideas and a lot of things that he wants to know and do and Again, this is the part of the book where they're growing up, so we understand this about them and um, kind of get to understand how they will impact the future of the family a little bit more. So we've now come to a point in the book where time is passing a little bit more quickly. We're kind of jumping ahead a little bit. And as time passes, um, Wang Lung and his family are becoming more wealthy and more prosperous. And um, at some point, Wang Lung finds himself in a brothel and he meets a sex worker by the name of Lotus. And Lotus is described as being just completely gorgeous, just out of this world, 
beautiful and he is smitten with her beauty and he starts spending a lot of time with her and eventually he becomes very jealous of the other men that she is spending her time with and so he wants to acquire her for himself she then becomes his concubine now before you get upset about terms let me explain a concubine technically is a woman who you have you have a relationship with this woman but because of xyz factor you can't enter into an actual marriage however you're an exclusive couple so she agrees to be his concubine and to move home with him but in order to do this um wang lung has to give her a bunch of money and jewels and he also has to pay a bunch of money to the brothel so that they will let her go with him he agrees to do both of these things And he gives the brothel a bunch of money, and he gives Lotus a bunch of money. But don't forget, Lotus also wanted jewels. So Wang Lung goes to Olan, and he takes the two pearls from her. He has them made into earrings, and then he gives them to Lotus, who then proceeds to move into their house. Now, come with me, because we need to talk about this for just a moment. After everything that they've been through, after everything that has happened, Olan only asked to keep the two pearls. And as far as I remember, she wasn't wearing them. She wasn't really using them. Like she just wanted, she just wanted to keep them. And Wang Lung takes them from her and gives them, not, and then makes them into jewelry and gives them to another woman. This is just heartbreaking in every sense of the word. I mean, it's literally the only thing Olan ever asked for. The only thing she ever asked for. And it's just, it's just so sad. It's so, it's so sad. (laughs) So, but because Olan is who she is, she endures this betrayal. However, her health and her morale quickly deteriorate after this. And she ends up passing away not long after witnessing the marriage of their oldest son to a wealthy girl from town. Now, it's not until after Olan passes away that Wang Lung finally starts appreciating her and realizing all that they've shared. And I find this incredibly infuriating because, I mean... (laughs) Read the book, please. But if you, you know, reading the earliest parts of the book when it's just Wang Lung and Olan and their little kids, they're just scraping life together. You know, they're creating, creating a life and creating a legacy. And they have honestly been through hell and back together. And just all that they've been through. And there are, there are moments in, in the earliest parts of the book when you just know that they really do love each other. They really do have this connection, this kind of this soul bond, to be honest. And it's just, it's really powerful. It truly is. And it's very precious and very sweet. And so for him to not really understand that until after she's gone is incredibly heartbreaking. And I just, I have so much admiration for Olan and the end of her life is incredibly sad. And as she's dying, she's thinking about Lotus and, you know, him basically having a second wife and all of these things that she's endured. And she says something like, you know, Lotus is beautiful and everything, but she didn't give him sons and I gave him sons. And so, you know, this kind of validates her and and gives her somewhat of a legacy. And then she passes away. And again, it's just heartbreaking. It's so devastating when we lose, when we lose Alon. And, and I mean, good for Wang Lung for finally realizing how incredible she is, but I mean, it's a little too late, my guy. I don't know. It's, it's a lot. And again, there's cultural differences we don't understand and, and all of that, but it's just, it's just so heartbreaking. It, and anyway, so not long after Olan passes away, the family moves into town and they rent the old house of Huang, which symbolism, anybody, anyone, maybe, probably, Raise your hand. Nobody? Okay, well, let me know if you figure it out. Um, At this point, Wang Lung is now an old man, and he only desires to have peace within his family. Now, 
At this time, there are constant disputes between his two oldest sons and their wives. So his oldest son and his wife, they're both more of the rich, snobby type of personality. His, his second son is more shrewd, more practical, and so is his wife. So these two couples are constantly butting heads, constantly creating just contention and, and just it's not a peaceful household. And it really, really aggravates Wang Lung and he doesn't know what to do about it. And then at this time, his third son approaches him and basically expresses discontent with his life. And because, you know, he has passions, he has ideas, he has things he wants to do. He expresses to Wang Lung that he's not happy, that there are things he wants more out of life. And, and Wang Lung can't really wrap his head around this. And he kind of just thinks like, okay, he's going through a phase that he needs to work out of. And so he actually tells his third son, like, you know, there are some sex workers or we have some slaves, like, you know, go spend some time with them and, you know, you can work through this and you'll be fine. And his son is like, literally, no, dad, like, that's not, no, that's not what this is. You don't understand. And then he later, he runs away to become a soldier. And Wang Lung is a very perplexed by this. There's a lot he can't wrap his head around. And I re- I remember very clearly reading this part of the book. And this is the part of the book where it kind of hit home to me like, oh, um, Wang Lung really is an old man at this point. Like he, there's so much going on in the younger generations and stuff that he just doesn't understand. And he's like, I don't understand why we can't all just vibe and be peaceful together. And it's actually, I, I feel like I've said this the whole time, which I probably have because it's true. It's it's a powerful moment. It's a little bit of a heartbreaking moment. And his son, again, ran away to be a soldier. And I think he kind of just tries to forget about it, honestly, and move on. And it's, again, it's sad. So the novel ends with Wang Lung overhearing a conversation between his two oldest sons. And they are planning to sell the land and split the profits between them. Obviously, Wang Lung is massively upset and devastated by this conversation that they're having and he starts getting he he kind of freaks out as you you know that kind of makes sense so he starts saying no you can't sell the land the land is everything as long as we have the land we'll be okay you know blah 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 it's this whole the theme of the land comes up again and he's trying to explain this to them and trying to explain to them why they can't sell the land and it's this honestly this heart-wrenching moment because he's very old and he can't really stand up and he's leaning on both of them and and begging them not to sell the land and they both say oh you know we, we promise we won't we're sorry we said that we're not going to sell the land and then they look up at each other and smile in a knowing way and that moment when the two boys look up and smile at each other knowingly right after promising not to sell the land That is the end of the book. Okay, okay, guys, I know, okay? I know, I know, I know. I literally know, okay? And this is why I told you that the spoilers aren't necessarily the end of the world. Because do we get closure? No. What even is the end of this book? What is it? It's it's insane. And quite honestly, I have been living in the devastation of the end of this book for like 10 years or something like that. So I actually don't have answers for you. And now we can all suffer together. Actually, no. Okay, that's kind of a joke. Here's the thing, guys. There actually are answers out there. That's right, my friends. The Good Earth is part of a series. Mm Mm-hmm. It is the first book in Pearl S. Buck's House of Earth trilogy. The second book, Sons, was published in 1932. So that's probably where we'd get our answers, everyone just saying. The third book is called A House Divided, and it was published in 1935. Now listen, I have never read these books because, according to the titles and, you know, just the general vibe, I feel like they would provide me with more emotional damage than actual closure. And since I'm still recovering from reading the first book, I've decided I'll just keep living in my limbo-like state and just, you know, I'm doing this for the greater good, really. And I will absolutely be posting the links to all of them. So if any of you feel so inclined to read them all, you may do so and let me know how that goes for you. 
because I mean, I do think it's important. I think it's very important. Will I be reading the other two? No, probably not ever. But again, I will give you the resources so that you can if you would like to. Now, you may think that we're at the end. We're not because we have we have more to talk about. First of all, we haven't really talked about the book very much, but we haven't talked about the author, Pearl S. Buck. And it's really important to talk more about her. Now that you know the story and you know what we're working with, I want to talk with you about Pearl and kind of add more context into everything. So, you know, it's just, it's really crucial. So her story is fascinating. And again, it provides a lot more context, not only for this book, but just for her writings in general. So Pearl S. Buck was born in the United States in 1892, but her parents moved to China when she was only a few months old in order to become Presbyterian missionaries. So Pearl grew up in China. She wrote The Good Earth while she was in, living in China, and she drew on her firsthand observations of Chinese village life. So this isn't just some woman thinking she maybe knows what she's talking about. No, she grew up in this area. She grew up in this time with these people, and she's drawing on things that she saw every day in order to write this book, which makes it all the more powerful. Um, she was actually at university when she wrote this book, so she spent the mornings in the attic of her house and completed the manuscript in one year. That's right, one year. Crazy town it is if you've, if you've ever written anything, okay? She completed this book in one year. Crazy stuff. And that was 1929 through 1930. Um, another fun fact about this book, in 1952, the typed manuscript and a whole bunch of other papers that belonged to Pearl were placed on display at the Museum of the American Academy of Arts and Letters in New York City. But mysteries, my friends, after the exhibit, the manuscript disappeared. It did. Gonzo. So Pearl wrote a memoir in 1966, and she has she's said to have written about the manuscript, quote, the devil has it. I simply cannot remember what I did with that manuscript. Even though if it does if it disappeared after an exhibit, I'm fairly sure we can assume it was stolen. Like I think, Pearl, I think you're I think it was stolen, Pearl. I think so. And she ended up passing away in 1973. And that was when her heirs reported it stolen. So thank you, heirs, for doing the right thing there. The book, the manuscript, excuse me, it actually was found. That's correct. It turned up at Freeman's Auctioneers and Appraisers in Philadelphia in 2007, my friends, when it was brought in for consignment. The FBI was, of course, notified, and it was handed over by the consigner. So throughout her life, Pearl was always committed to China, which she considered her homeland, and she was always promoting cultural growth and acceptance. Her work is inc uh, just wildly influential, okay? it's just, Her works were very, very influential in both China and in the United States. Some saw the, the Good Earth and other works that were similar to it as creating sympathy for China that then impacted opinions and foreign policy in World War II. To that, I say no. Um, but the diplomatic historian Walter Lefebvre said it a little bit better than me. He agreed that Americans grew enamored of heroic Chinese characters that, per that were portrayed by writers like Pearl. But, quote, these views of China did not shape U.S. policy after 1937. If they had, Americans would have been fighting in Asia long before 1941, which to which I say, yes, sir. Thank you very much. So eventually, Pearl's life consisted of her going back and forth from the U.S. and China for business and teaching, etc. But she mostly lived in China because that was her home. However, she was in the United States at one point, and the communist government in China banned her from returning there, and they also banned her works from being read. She was obviously devastated and that she couldn't return home. And you know there are um, there are accounts of people who eventually left China and were able to read her works and how one woman said that she broke down sobbing when she was finally able to read Pearl's work. and that is incredibly powerful. Another thing that Pearl is known for is um, her support of 
racial awareness. There were a lot of, again, racial issues. I don't know why I said again. I think I meant obviously. Race has often been a thing. We'll say that. And she um, was really not okay with it. So one amazing thing she did, she founded Welcome House, which was the first international interracial adoption agency. Like, what? She's incredible. She's amazing. She's She might be an actual angel. I love Pearl S. Buck. I love her so much. And learning all of this about her, I think it brings a great deal of context into the good earth and into a lot of other things. So I hope that you enjoyed that little tidbit about Pearl. So here we are, my friends. We've talked about Pearl. You know the story of the good earth. Let's let's kind of recap, okay? The Good Earth is a fabulous book, both both on its own as a story and also just for the wider issues and themes that it speaks to. There are so many precious moments in this book. There are so many heartbreaking moments. There's even though this book is a drama and quite sad, there's so much about it that it's that's I want to say recommendable. It is recommendable, but it's so much more than that. I just really, friends, you really, really need to go read this book. Olan is a character that I have a really hard time describing, to be honest. The hardship and heartache that she goes through, the love that she has for Wang Lung and for their children, she's just this quiet, immovable, powerful human being. And I admire her so much. She's who I think about the most every time this book comes to my head. I think about her often. And I just, I've always found her inspiring and always had this place in my heart for Olan and for the life that she lived. And I know she's very admirable. We'll say that. And the heartbreaking moments in this book, of which there are many, they they hit differently for me. They always have. And I think it's because of the way this book is written and kind of, kind of how life is framed. You know, this book is written in a style that's very different from anything I'm used to. And it's, and it, life in this book is framed differently. Again, there's cultural differences. There's a lot about this book that makes it unfamiliar, even though it's life. And so when things like this happen, again, it just feels like it hits differently. And there's something really, really powerful and moving about that. This book has always resonated with me for so many reasons. And I think there's so much in it that can resonate with a lot of people. And I think that's probably the main reason that it had and it still has a lot of power and influence and the potential to keep having power and influence in this world. I absolutely love this book. I'm weirdly grateful that I had to read this book in class. And um, again, I read it when I was a teenager and it's something that I still think about to this day. It's a powerful book about love and family, about trust, faith, traditions. It's about home. It's about so many different things. And again, I think because it's about so many different things, there's something in it that can resonate with just about anybody which is one of the reasons that it's so recommendable. And if you do one thing for yourself, read this book. Please read this book. I'm just, uh, I love this book. And I'm so glad we got to talk about it today. Um, Please, again, please find the time to acquire this book and read it. I'd love to talk more about it with all of you. I'd love to have more more of a discussion about all the various things that we talked about and the different parts of the book. So please read this book and let me know how it goes. Um, you can also follow me on Instagram at not strictly history underscore podcast, or you can shoot me an email at not strictly history at gmail.com. If you'd like to request a topic, start a conversation, anything like that. Thank you so, so much for hanging out with me today and for being here for our very first book episode. I love you guys so much and I'll see you next time on not strictly history.